Okay, so last week, um, uh, for those of you who are here and for those of you that find last week a bit fuzzy this morning, um, we looked at nine of the elementary principles of Christianity, and I want to review those nine. First was of uh, the inspiration and the inerrancy of the Bible. That was one. Second was Christianity is a tr we are Trinitarians, Father, Son, and Spirit. The third item we looked at was the deity of Christ. Okay. Fourth, the virgin birth of Christ. The fifth was the person, the work, the deity of the Holy Spirit. Okay, again, Trinitarians. The sixth item was the sinfulness of man. We kind of talked about that. All you had to do is look outside or look in the mirror, right? Plenty of evidence. Seventh was the idea of the substitutionary atonement. Number eight was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the final point was the return of Christ, right? That day is coming. Um, you know, it's interesting as we were doing our, as Nathan was leading through the songs today, I was kind of on my fingers counting the points that we covered last week that were covered in those songs, and almost all of them were. Those are good songs. They point us in the right direction. And although they're, we refer to them as elementary, right, uh, all nine of these points are vitally important to our faith, our walk, and our growth as believers. Um, the principles, uh, these are the principles believers need to have a solid understanding of the gospel, both for the inquisitive and the critic. You know, in 1 Peter, he says, be ready to make a defense or give a defense to everyone who asks for the hope that's in you. People say, why are you a Christian? Why do you believe? Why do you live like you do? Peter says, you need to know these things because then you can articulate an answer. When somebody asks you that question to stand there and drool out of the side of your mouth, it's not a convincing argument, right? Now, from those nine, nine points we looked at last week, I posed a question and asked you to do some homework, two things in homework. The first was to take the scriptures that were listed in the handout last week and, and review them all. Now, if you lost your copy or the dog ate your handout, uh, we'll get you another copy if you didn't do it. And you can still do it because I think there's still benefit of taking. There's a lot of verses that we presented that we didn't talk about. And, and they'll shore up your faith in all those areas. They're good for you. Now, the second part of the homework, uh, which was dependent somewhat on the first part, was to consider how you're going to answer this question. All right? First Peter, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's in you. The question is, what is the single most important theological aspect of Christianity? In other words, if what your answer is, there a single point or an issue on which Christianity hinges, where it it, it, it um, floats or it sinks, it soars or it crashes out of the sky, uh, it's true or it's false? That was the question. And then the question kind of along that is, does the Bible provide you an answer to that? If so, where and what does it say? Now I'm going to tell you that we had one gold star student last week, Tim, back here, we're going to stand up there, Tim, let everybody know. Before we left the building, he had the right answer. He came up to me, he goes, blah, 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 and I said, you're right. And I'm joking with him, I told him I was going to do that. But you know, the point was, is to get you to think. Okay? Because as you think through this, when you are challenged or asked, you're going to be more able to um, articulate a, a well-founded answer. Right? You know, joking aside, drooling out the side of our mouth when somebody asks us, if somebody challenges us, you know, it's, you know that kindergarten... Um, argument because I said so, you know, my dad's better than your dad, why? Because my dad's better than, you know, you get in that argument. And, and for a lot of the critics, that's really where Christians end up with, because you're not able to articulate an answer, given a reason for the hope that's in you. Now understand that there's a level that every, there's a point that every one of those points uh, Christianity is dependent upon, okay? Um, if any of these positions were invalid, then we wouldn't really have a, base, a basis for our faith. That's true. But there is one point in those that God has provided that, it, in fact, validates the other eight points. That's the key. This one point, the Bible tells us, validates all the other assertions that we as Christians make. 
okay? And hopefully from all the songs that Nathan led you in today and all the conversation and the prayer and reading, you figured it out, right? And what's that one point? The one point that God has given us an answer that says, with this point being factual, you can trust the other eight, okay? Well, I'm going to tell you this. Paul spends the entire 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians discussing this one point. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the answer to your homework. That is the answer to the question. Now today we're going to look at why the resurrection is the answer to the question. And additionally, we're going to look at what Jesus' resurrection provides for the believers today. Okay? Those are the two points. And although we're going to kind of look at 1 Corinthians 15, we're not going to do an in-depth study of 15. We're really going to kind of use it as an introduction to the rest of the, the study today. Okay? And, but I'm going to tell you, it'll be your benefit, and it's your homework assignment, to read 1 Corinthians 15 this week. Okay? It's going to be a blessing to you. It's going to be an inspiration. It's going to be an encouragement. It's going to comfort you. Okay? It's going to really address your heart and, the, and your soul in that level. But remember, it's going to confirm and substantiate the other eight points we've talked about. So it really will build your faith. It'll help you. Um, and I think we all need that. Now, in this chapter 15, uh, about the resurrection, Paul does talk, covers three things. First, he covers the facts about the resurrection. Secondly, he covers the order of the resurrection, order of the resurrection, Jesus being first, giving us a hope and a promise for ourselves. And thirdly, he talks about the mystery of the resurrection. Now, we're not going to cover those today, but they're there for you to go read and study and learn. Um, now, in last week it was called, the title of the sermon was First Importance. Well, the reason I used that was in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, as Paul gives his gospel message, that's what he calls it. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 1, 15, 1 through 4. Now, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you stand, by which you also are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. Then, um, right after He gives this Gospel message, um, which the resurrection is dependent upon. If you, if you follow what he's saying, here's the good, good news. If he's in that grave, this is not good news. The resurrection, the gospel message is dependent upon that resurrection. And right after he gets done in verse 4, in verses 5 through 8, Paul then provides firsthand corroborating evidences of the resurrection. In verses 5 through 8, he says, And then he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. And that's his way of saying, a lot of them are here, some have died. Verse 7, Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me. The resurrection has been validated. That was one of the points we made last week. The resurrection is one of the most, if not the most, uh, validated events in history. Okay? There's no other event in history where the opposition has been so vehemently opposed to it for so long, and to the point that those who are in opposition have not, have not stopped at murder. You follow that? There are people who are so opposed to the idea of the resurrection from the beginning they killed or attempted to kill people who said there was a resurrection. Okay? And if the resurrection was a lie, it would have died long ago. Because people aren't going to die for a knowing lie. Okay? And that's why we say the whole of Christianity rests upon the fact of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. In, in fact, despite... Uh, what the enemies, the skeptics, and the unbelievers say or argue, 
Christ has been raised from the dead. Now, you're going to hear that verse a lot today, and you're always going to say in your mind when I read it, you're going to go 1 Corinthians 15, 20. And if you do that, I guarantee you by the time you leave here, you'll have a verse tucked away in the old memory slot. And if somebody says, He is risen, thank you. But you'll be able to know because it's 1 Corinthians 15, 20. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. I like the word he uses, in fact. That's a truth. Now, in verses 13 and 14, he addresses both the reality of the resurrection, the fact that one could be raised from the dead, uh, and specifically the resurrection of Jesus. Verses 13, he says, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our, your, then our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. Paul's making a logical argument. If there's no resur resurrection, there's three truths that you need to know. There is no hope. There is no faith. And thirdly, there is no salvation. That's if there's no resurrection. In addition to um, the resurrection of Christ being proven, it's the integral part of the gospel, as we talked about, and it provides the blessings for the believers going forward. Okay? There are blessings that we're going to look at, six of them, from, for the Christian because the resurrection is true. It comes as, you know, in Christianity, in the gospel. As you go through Christianity, the gospel stays true. It's not a one-time event. You live in the gospel, the good news. Okay? We talked about some of these last week. We're going to go a little bit deeper today. The first item is confidence. What do you get from the resurrection? You get confidence. Why? Because it proves that Jesus is God. Okay? It proves that Christ is God. Again, we said that last week. Romans 1, 4. Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. The resurrection gives you confidence, right? It unequivocally proves that God and Christ is God. He is divine. He is who He claimed to be. He was God in the flesh. Okay? If Christ were not raised, it wouldn't be unreasonable for someone to question or doubt His sayings. Okay? Or his claims. If he didn't come out of the grave, you could reasonably say, I don't believe he's God. That would not be unreasonable. But the fact he came out of the grave says he is God. Okay? And as Paul said, and hundreds, thousands, and millions over the course of the centuries have tested to the fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. I know you all just said that in your head. Right? But that's the verse. It proves He's God, therefore He is eternal. He's omnipresent, He's omniscient, omnipotent, and immutable. Believers can confidently trust everything Jesus said or taught and every promise He made. Okay? You know, 2 Timothy 1.2, Paul says, For this reason I suffer these things. I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day. He's talking about the omniscient, omnipotent God. This is Christ. He's trusted everything into him. So we have a confidence from the resurrection. Christ is God. He is who he claimed to be. I can trust what he said. I can trust what the word of God gives me from his lips. Secondly, the resurrection gives you an assurance. Assurance. Life eternal. That's the assurance we have from the resurrection. You're not dead and buried and done with. There is life eternal. It gives us a confidence of his authority and power. Again, this points to Christ. In Romans 14, Paul says that the resurrection demonstrates God's Christ's authority and sovereignty in verse 14.8. Uh, for if we live, we, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. You see, this is one of the things where 
they came to Jesus, they challenged him, they thought they had this little, little uh, story they could give Jesus and put him in a, you know, tie him up in knots. And the whole point was they're debating about whether there's a resurrection in general. And, and, the, and the argument's another issue, but the answer of Christ was phenomenal. He says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? You've got to catch there. God, in the, at the time of Christ, refers back to Abraham a thousand plus years earlier and speaks of him in the present tense. I am the God of Abraham. Okay? Abraham is not dead in God's book. The resurrection is our assurance that we have eternal life. It provides that assurance of his sovereign power over life and death, a living and dead. And Jesus will reward those who have trusted him with eternal life, whether they live or die. Why? Because Christ has been raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Amen. Amen. Likewise, don't worry, Jesus is not unfair. He will compensate the unbelievers, those who reject the offer of salvation, with the wages of sin. And that is eternal death. Romans 6, 22 and 23. And Nathan said, we read it. Now, having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification, the outcome, eternal life. If you believe, you have eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin, for those who do not receive Christ, they, they will receive their just wages, and it will be eternal death. Okay? But for a believer, you have the assurance of eternal life. Thirdly, what does is, what is the resurrection mean for me today as a believer? I love this one. It's access. God is now approachable. Okay? His resurrection provides man with access to God through a living Savior. This is critical. We need to look no further than his own word to know because Christ has been raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15.20 we do not need a personal visit or a personal audience with Jesus. Now, this is in Romans 10. I'm going to read some verses 6 through 10. Because there's a lot of people who want their faith shored up. And they say, you know, if I was just there when Jesus was there, if I could just go touch Jesus. You know, why did Jesus have to die? Why did you stay so when, you know, 2,000 years later, I could get over to Jerusalem and meet with him? In Romans 10, 6 says, but the righteousness of faith based on faith, speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, and who will descend into the abyss, and that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. In the mouth, confession, he confesses, resulting in salvation. That's a picture. He says you don't need to have that personal visitation. It's in the Word, the Bible. He's alive. You can know him today. as uh, the song. How do I know? He's alive. He's in my heart. I know that. Hebrews uh, 4.14, uh, he tells us we can, because of this, we can confidently approach the Lord. We can, go, we can go to the Lord, though He's not here. Isn't that phenomenal? You can talk to the God of creation, although He's not here. Uh, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things, and yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. That's a great privilege as a believer. You have access to God. You can go to Him when you need Him, and you always need Him. In chapters 2 and 3 of Ephesians, Paul tells the believers that they have access to the Father, they're no longer strangers or alienated, but they're part of God's family. In Ephesians 2, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Why? The resurrection. He's alive. Ephesians 3 was in accordance to the eternal purposes which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in Him. That's the third benefit we have as believers. God is approachable. We have access. Fourthly, justified or justification means you've been declared righteous. If you understand that, and we're going to try to take a quick look at it, you should feel this burden lift off of you. Right? Sin condemns. If you carry that sin, it's condemning. And you've been called justified or righteous by God. All right? It's a declaration the Father makes of us being righteous, and it rests upon, you guessed it, the resurrection of Christ. In Romans 4.25, He was delivered over for our transgressions and raised because of our justification. That's what He's done for us, right? Hebrews 10.14 is that it says that Christ's one-time atoning death paid the full price of sin for every, forever for every man once for all time. For by one offering He is perfected for all time those who are sanctified. He's done it once. And this is, again, a thing for a believer is understanding what it means that Christ has died for us and He's rose again. He's raised for our justification. And that resurrection is how we have this justification imputed to us because it shows us the, all those other points we talked about, how God has worked in Him. Because if Christ were not raised, it would mean nothing, right? There'd be no hope. But Christ has been raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. What does that tell us? It proves. This is the, the proof side of it. The resurrection of Christ proves that de the death of Christ on the cross was sufficient for what the writer in Hebrews tells us, that it was a, sufficient to pay the price for sin. Because if it were not sufficient, that would have implied, that would have meant that Christ was not sinless, that Christ would have had sin on him, and he would not have come out of the grave. The fact that he came out of the grave is that he was sinless, and his payment was sufficient to answer the price for man's sin. Um, <clears throat> it's a blessing to know that Christ's death on the cross did that, and, and it gives us a freedom in Christ. You know, John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Okay? In Romans 8, it's God says He demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Listen to verse 9. Much more than, having been justified by His blood, we will be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we will be saved by His life. And again, this all comes out of the resurrection. We have the resurrection as the proof that his payment on the cross was what needed to be done. It had to pay, it paid the full price of man's sin. Now the fifth item I have is new life. <clears throat> new life. And that's what I call the promise fulfilled. In the resurrection, we, and in Christ, it gives us a new life. And Paul t uh, Peter tells us um, that our very regeneration, this new life, is connected and dependent upon the resurrection of Christ. And that's in 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. But if you noticed in there, your regeneration, as he said, through the resurrection of Christ. So your, your new birth, your born againness. He says it happened through the resurrection. You can see why the resurrection is so important to Christianity. You also should be able to see why the critics and those opposed to the, the message of the gospel have been so vehemently opposed to the idea of the resurrection. Why they tried to dispel the resurrection and minimize it or get people to deny it. 
because if you do, then it becomes literally a house of cards that falls apart, right? Now, it may sound like a small thing, the idea of a new birth, like, oh, well, because a lot of people like that, well, I'm born again, you know, that became very popular back like in 1975 or 72 or you know, someplace there was an election that somebody said that and caused a lot of rancor. But is it a big deal? Well, remember in John 3, <clears throat> Jesus repeatedly told Nicodemus that very thing. In John 3, 3, and if you know the story of Nicodemus, he comes to God, he comes to Jesus, and he says, you know, we know you're a man of God because you know, nobody can do what you're doing unless God's with him. You know, he's, he's got a sales pitch, I suspect, that he wants to present to Jesus about bringing him in the fold, right? Jesus cuts him right off. In John 3, 3, Jesus answered him, and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That, that would like uh, proverbially took the, the wind out of his sails, right? Because he was the teacher of Israel. And then in John 3, 7, he says, do not be amazed that I say you must be born again. He said it twice in one chapter. Okay. Now, the word anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N, uh, means from above or anew. So I always like that when you hear born again, it really is born from above, born anew. I think there's a little bit more to that when we see it that way than just saying be born again. Okay? Without the resurrection, Jesus said, uh, we would not, we could not be born again or from above. Without the resurrection. We would still possess our sinful Adamic nature, doomed eternally, uh, as we're already dead. Uh, before being born again. But again, bless God, Christ has been raised from the dead. John 3:15 3, and 16, you probably know 16 really well, but 3:15 says, so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. That's your hope. You will have eternal life if you believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now he's repeated himself twice in two verses. And the promise is eternal life. And as we looked at the eternal life, Peter says, it's through the resurrection of Christ. Uh, if you've trusted in Christ, you've been born again. And in case you didn't catch that from your fourth grade grammar, and I'll actually look this up, that's called a present perfect continuous statement. You have eternal life if you've been born again. Now, I don't know what that means, but it says it's pretty fancy fourth grade grammar that I didn't catch. Okay. The sixth point that really helps us is a hope. What's that hope? Your own resurrection. If you pass from this life, and we have a ceremony here, and you decide to get put in the ground one way or another, that's not the end of it. That's what the world's, that is why the world is so upset. That is why they spend untold efforts to try and prevent that at any level. Right? Because they have no hope. We have a hope. Ultimately, our resurrection is fully dependent upon and rests on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain, and your faith is also in vain. That's what it says. The reality is that Christ, if Christ is not raised from the dead, I'm going to tell you there is absolutely no hope for anyone, anywhere, at any time, because then there is no resurrection of any kind. You've got to let that one sink in. That's why the resurrection is so critical. If there is no resurrection of Christ, then there will be no resurrection for you. Okay? We've, been see, we've seen this throughout the message this whole week, however, that Christ has been raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. So then all that have ever, all that have ever or will ever live will be raised. The fact that Christ has been raised says that there will be a resurrection. Why? Because God told us that. Remember what did the resurrection do? It validated all the other points. And the first point was the inspiration of the gospel, of the, of the Bible. And the Bible is real clear that there is a resurrection for, the, for all mankind. And we'll look at that. But for us, there's a hope. Why? 
because it gives us a hope of our own resurrection and that we're not going to be left to, to, to the ground. We will live again and we will see the Lord in the flesh. Romans 8, 11, If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, ye, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Romans 8, 11 promises you that if you've trusted in Christ, you will see Him in the flesh. You will have a resurrected body. John Revel in John, in Revelation uh, 20, verse 6, he talks about the, the blessing for the believer of the resurrection. I'm going to read you uh, Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. That's the picture of the millennial reign. But the point is, blessed are you. God says if you're in the first resurrection with Christ, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. Because a little later on in that chapter, starting in chapter uh, 20, verse 11, is the consequences for those who have not trusted in Christ. He says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, and from whose presence heaven and earth fl fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead and which was in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, and every one of them according to their deeds. Then the death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. But if you've got to tie that back to earlier, he said, Blessed are you, if you're in Christ, because if your name is in the book of life, then the, uh, the power, there's no power in the second death, which he later tells you the second death is a lake of fire. That's a blessing. You have this assurance of a resurrection, which is a positive thing. For the believer, the resurrection is a good thing. For the unbeliever, it's a terrible thing. Now I'm going to close with your opportunity. This is all good stuff. But out of this is an opportunity. Okay? Every person, regardless of who they are, where they come from, you're in one of two camps today. There it is. You, you, that's all you are. You're either heeded the call of Christ in your life, and you have Christ as your Savior, and you surrender to Him. To him. Or you haven't. That's just a fact. If you have and you've been born again, you can rejoice in the mercy and the grace of God. Okay? And out of that, you, you obtain a confidence, an assurance, you have access, you're justified, you have new life, and you have a hope. Okay? The blessing of God for the believer are all tied in and through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. From our regeneration, Peter to our, a, a, our eternal resting in His presence is glory in the book of Revelation. That's all there. And this is why we say the whole of Christian faith hinges on this glorious fact that Christ has been raised from the dead. Okay? Now, however, if you're not, or if you haven't, or if you can't say for certainty that you ever have yielded to the Spirit, ever given your life to Christ when He's called, you have a resurrection too. The problem is, your resurrection is not something, is not a blessing. It's not going to be glorious. It's going to be torment, okay? Because you're doomed to the eternal lake of fire. We just read that. But all is not lost. If you hear his voice today and answer his call, you too can be born again, here and now, in accepting Christ. You can have your name written in the book of life. Why? Because today is a day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, he says, The acceptable time I, will call, I listen to you on the day of salvation. But behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is a day of salvation. In Romans 10, 13, you're told, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I'm going to invite you that as we sing this song of invitation with the, our, our music group, that if you hear Christ's voice, this is the time to come forward. And we'll talk to you, the elders or the pastors, and we can help you in that.
Let's close in prayer. Lord, we just pray. We just praise you and worship you, Lord, for your word, for the resurrection, for the hope that it gives us, for the assurance that it gives us, for the new life, for the justification, for the acceptance, and for the access, Lord. And we just pray that your spirit would move in the hearts of the men and women. If any of them here do not know you, that they would come today and answer the call in Christ's name. Amen.